Well, let's continue then, if you'll open in your Bibles, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. <coughs> this morning, we're going to finish up chapter 2, and at Southside, that's a big deal. We celebrate chapters here. So I'm going to just read the beautiful verses that are before us. Uh, we left off in verse 24, if you'll read with me. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by his wounds you were healed, for you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. May God bless the preaching of his word. As we finish up this chapter, we finish the sweetness of the honey from the honeycomb. We're going to look at the doctrine of substitutionary atonement, that Jesus Christ took our place uh, on that cross, the cross of Christ, the cornerstone that the church is built on, the heart of the church, the heart of the Lord's table, do this in remembrance of me. The essence of the Christ, Christian gospel, the very morrow of our lives is what we will look at this morning. We have a God who is holy and just. He's infinitely pure and can't even look upon sin. No sin can be in his presence without being consumed. And he's a just God who in his very nature has to do what is right and he must punish sin and give it its rightful consequence for what we have done. We have a bad record because of Adam and we have a bad heart. We have a bad heart that comes in this world committed and devoted to self, to satisfy self, to look at life through the lens of self. It's really the worst news there is. There's a holy, just God, and there are people who are devoted to self and therefore sinning on a daily basis. Jesus told us in John 3, therefore the wrath of God is abiding upon us in that state. The, the, the wrath of God is on us, said Jesus Christ. And then from heaven comes the Son of God, and he was born into the world, and he's brought the best news because of the best work of Christ. He came endowed with salvation, and he came at a great cost. The just one came and went in the place of the unjust ones. The cross is a substitution, the truth that has no end for our hearts. I can dwell on it. I've known it for 30 years, and it gets sweeter and fuller as you journey. Amen. Spurgeon said, if you take it out of the Bible, it's a dark book, add it, and it's abundant joy. Christ Jesus died for us. The commentator Leon Morris said, all of redemption is substitutionary. He said, Jesus paid it in our stead. Justification is a legal liability in our standing before God. He took our punishment and he gave us his record. Reconciliation is hostility between us and God, and it's been taken away by nailing it to the cross of Christ. Propitiation is the removal of the divine wrath of God that was on us. He bore it. All of our salvation then hangs on the sweet word of substitution. Jesus took our place on a cross, and this morning I want to come and fix our attention on this great truth and pray that the Spirit of God will illuminate to our hearts in the fullest measure so that we might show forth the excellencies of him who has called us out of darkness unto his marvelous light, that we might have a glad surrender and submission to our God in the midst of unreasonable and harsh treatment by others that we've been learning in Peter that we might die to sin and live to righteousness because of this cross. And so let's go before our God and let's pray and ask him to meet us and show us the glory and the beauty of this cross. Father, we come before you and the natural eye can't see the glory of what we'll look at this morning. Father, your spirit must open our eyes to see it. Your spirit must illuminate it to even believing minds and hearts here today. And so I pray, Holy Spirit, do your work. Put a floodlight on Jesus Christ. Let us gaze and look at him in all of his beauty and glory as a substitute for us. God, I pray that we would see it in such a way that we have died to sin and live to righteousness. I pray that it would bear its beautiful, right fruit in our lives this morning. Let no one look at the cross of Christ and be unchanged. Let no one look at it and leave it as a, a simple truth, but God, let it 
be in our minds and hearts to the right degree and place that it should be. And so do what no man can do, God. Reveal the cross of Christ to our hearts here this morning, we pray in the name of Jesus. So let me first give you kind of bird's eye view of this passage again, and then we'll, we'll drill down to the cross, but I don't want to lose the setting that Peter dropped it in so beautifully. There's a context to these amazing words, and there's a sweet reason why Peter now chooses to drop it in, in at this time in his epistle, and so we need to see that. And therefore, the key to being a, a gospel preacher for any of us is Peter's trying to help a church then under great persecution, and we need to understand the therefore. We, we must understand there's a gospel and there's a therefore of how we live. And so how do we live when a government and bosses and authorities are closing in on us and persecuting us? Their light is shining rightly, the church, and the world's hating them for it. The hatred is revealing their enmity against God, and it's coming out on the believers. And so how do you endure such treatment as society turns on you when they're unjust and they treat you wrongly and they're unreasonable? How do you live in such a way that they see this marvelous light that we have been called to? How do we live in such a way that they glorify God on the day of their visitation because of our excellent behavior? I want to live in such a way that one day they get saved and say, thank you for that excellent behavior that you modeled in light of all my unjust, evil treatment towards you. That's what we're working at. That's what Peter is after right now in this section of his letter. Peter tells us we need to submit. That was our command in the midst of this. Government, he says, is established by God, and is therefore to be submitted to by godly citizens because we are submitting to our God, and for good reasons that government was given to punish evildoers and to reward those who do right, to not be rebel rousers and disobeying authorities and fighting them and slandering them, freedom to be a slave of God, to submit to God, unreasonable masters and servants he addressed next. And this time he says, be submissive, but he even throws a prepositional phrase with all respect. Be submissive with all respect to these authorities and bosses that are going to be unreasonable in your life. That is not the answer that you would expect. In light of society mistreating the people of God so unjustly that they've been scattered. And if you're struggling with that, I want you to look at the perfect example that we looked at last week. And Peter pulls out the example of Jesus Christ. There's never a greater injustice done to anyone who, who only did mankind good. It's, it's really the peak of both. There, there's never been a greater injustice in the history of the world, and there's never been anyone who's done men good better or more excellently than Jesus Christ. So we have the peak of both. And so how did society respond and treat him? Well, they hated him. And they sneered and they rejected him and they nailed him up on a cross as a criminal as they mocked him. And as they did all of this, they could get nothing out of him. Peter says there was no reviling. He watched it. There was no threatening. There was no defending the false accusations. And finally, they could get a few words out of him. And the few words that came out of him, and, and he starts to talk, and they're probably like, what, what is he saying? Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Father, forgive them. <laughs> How? Well, Peter says he kept entrusting himself to the one who judges righteously. The, the way they got that out of Christ in his response is he was entrusting himself to his Father. I will keep dying for the world. My job is love and sacrifice, and the Father will deal rightly and justice. I give it to God. I entrust myself to the Father as our example, that as I'm mistreated and all these things come upon me, I can give that to God. Mine is to shine the light and to love and bring truth into this world. That's my focus. So isn't that a beautiful example? There's just not a better one ever, the example of Jesus Christ. But I got a problem. I, I need more than an example. I don't know about you. I'm, I'm drowning in my sin. I tend to look at life through the lens of self. 
I like to think about me. It's natural. It's easy for me. So if someone wrongs me, you know what that means? I'm the biggest deal in the world, so this really upsets me. If you mess with me or mistreat me, I boil, I revile, I can't sleep. I have to make things right. I have to get them told. My spiritual gift is justice. I've heard that before, just so you know. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not making that up. What a gift. <laughs> Administer it wisely. So how is looking at Jesus' example going to do anything but bury me deeper under my guilt? How is that not going to do that? I look at that perfect example and it reminds me of how terrible I am at this. It doesn't do much for me except show me once again how far I am from living this way. Thank you very much, Peter. This is an old illustration. I'm going to use it anyways because I'm old. (laughs) Mark Spitz for the old guys. Michael Phelps for the younger guys. I want you to just... Picture these Olympic swimmers if you've never heard those names. And the, the example is I want you to picture that you cannot swim. For me, that's very easy. And you fall overboard a, a boat in the middle of rough waters, and you're drowning, and you have no life vest and no preserver. And it just so happens, I'm going to use Michael Phelps is on board the boat. And he jumps in, and he comes, and he swims around you, and the guy has perfect butterfly form. And then he does back, he could do the IM, he does backstroke, breaststroke, and freestyle, it's perfect. And he's just doing it around you while you're gargling, drowning. Your great example is doing nothing for me right now. I need saving. Then we can work on my swimming, amen? God did not just give us an example of how to endure mistreatments and injustice at the hands of sinners. He gave us a savior. The example of the cross was doing more than just being an example. He was dying for sinners on that cross to set us free from sin so that we might be able to live to righteousness, to live the kind of life that Peter's calling us to in this text. So some way the cross will break the bondage of sin so that we can now live righteous lives. That is in the cross, it has that power It is not just an example. And that's my prayer this morning, that none of us would walk out of here without understanding that and how it can do that in your life so that we might walk out in freedom, a slave to serve the living God, to entrust ourselves to him while enduring the hostility and unjust hatred from this world. Guys, it can be done because Christ was more than an example because he's a savior from sin. And so what I would like to do is look at our outline this morning and journey this Mount Everest of truth. In 1 Peter 2, uh, 24 through 25, Peter shows us how we're to respond to unjust treatment as servants. And we've, we've seen in verses 18 through 20 the command for submission and suffering. We saw in verses 21 through 23 the example of Christ in submission and suffering. unjustly. And now, this morning, we're going to look at the power for submission and suffering. So, last week, we looked at the standard, and tonight, we're going to, tonight, this morning, we're going to look at the substitute, and we're going to look at the shepherd and and see the beauty of what Peter is after. But before I begin, I just, I, I told you last week that Peter quotes Isaiah 53 five times, and I just want to read it to set our context as we begin. So if you want, you can turn to Isaiah 53, and if, if not, you can just listen uh, to me as I read it. <clears throat> Get a sip of water in case you are turning. Again, almost a thousand years before Christ walked this earth, these words are going to be written about him. If you've come here this morning and you're not a believer, and Jesus Christ, that testimony that you just heard, that's the gospel, is, is people who can suffer like that. They, they still suffer, but the power and faith that they have in God is holding them and changing and transforming them. That's the gospel, and now I'm going to read to you why they can be that way. And so that's what you need. That's what you need. You don't need a good example. You don't need moral reform. You need a Savior. And I want you to hear now from Isaiah How do you write this stuff a thousand years before exactly in detail? 
Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? <clears throat> For he, Jesus, <clears throat> grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of parched ground, and he had no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and he was forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that is taken away. And, and as for uh, this generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due, his grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was, he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief, if he would render himself as a guilt offering in our place. And he will see his offspring, us, and he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. And as a result of the anguish of his soul, <clears throat> he will see it and be satisfied. And by his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. Amen? Jesus was not just a martyr. He didn't die for some cause. He didn't die to be an example. He died to make atonement, which means at one minute. He died to, to take the punishment for our sin so we could be at one with God so that we could dwell and be in relationship with God. The substitutionary atonement is the grounds of how we return good for evil. Because your sins have been forgiven in this way, we now respond in a whole different way to this world. Before that, when, when I was first awakened and I became aware of my guilt before God and my condemnation and the law and the threatening, and there was a season of laboring under that, trying to work my way out of it to get right with God. And I, I, when I was in that state, I could not think about anyone but one person. I was so weighted down, I could think of Ken Murphy only. I had no emotional resource for anyone but myself because of what I was wrestling with. How could I ever think about others? How could I ever endure any ill treatment? There was an anger just ready to explode. With, with that weight and burden on my heart, I could do nothing. And so the life of goodness and godliness and excellent behavior then originates in being forgiven for sin by a substitutionary atonement. Not just in being forgiven, but it's how we're forgiven is the amazing part. He was crushed for our iniquities. He was pierced through for our transgressions. We can live the way that Peter is calling us to because of this reality. So what I want to do is look at the cross and the substitutionary atonement for that fruit in our lives. So I want to look at three things about the nature of what Peter is telling us. And the first thing is it was voluntary. If you'll look with me in verse 24, something that should almost take your breath away is, and he himself, the matchless one, it's intensive because it's so hard to believe, uh, he himself, God himself, Christ Jesus, no one else could have done this. This is a job description only for the Son of God. We needed God to be fully man, to be sufficient, to come and make an atonement for our sin. And so he himself, just take that in. He himself, Jesus himself, went up Calvary's mountain. He went to the cross, which in the Greek means wood. He went on the wood. He went up on the cross. He himself 
was put upon it. He was fastened to it with spikes, he himself. No man takes my life, but I lay it down for the sheep. It's willful. He himself came to do this and to be a propitiation. I think of Abraham and Isaac. As Abraham's son was put up there as a sacrifice and the knife is about to be driven through his chest by his father, God said, stop. Now I know that you fear God and you'll withhold nothing from me. And there's a ram caught in a thicket. And that can be a substitute now and and it can make sacrifice. But this day on the same mountain with Jesus Christ, there was no ram in a thicket. This son will be pierced through for our transgressions, and he will die for our iniquities. He himself would be the sacrifice. And these two words have left me in worship this week. I pray it's doing the same for your heart. Only the son of God, the creator of the whole universe, he himself bore our sin on a cross. Don't ever get familiar with that. Is it any wonder that the angels have an epithumia wanting to look at this gospel? They're looking at he himself hanging on a cross. The object of their worship for all of eternity is now being killed by sinful men. What is this? He himself is one for the ages. Secondly, it says he himself bore our sins. The word bore means to carry a massive, heavy weight. The weight of sin is the rightful judgment of God upon it. He bore the punishment then of what our sins deserved before God. It's a massive weight. In the college group, we've been kind of doing Easter early, and we looked at the Garden of Gethsemane. Then we looked at the crucifixion, and this Friday we looked at the resurrection, And when we looked at that garden, you know, three times Jesus prays, let this cup pass, let this cup pass, let this cup pass. He's overwhelmed with one thing, the cup. What is in that cup is now brought the Son of God, and it says it baptized him into a bloody sweat. As he looks, what's in that cup is the wrath of God that he has to drink to get it off and propitiate it from us. And and in his humanity, I believe he's, he's seeing the fullness of it, he's looking at it. And as he looks at it, he's sweating then blood. It caused his deity and his humanity to shrink back from it. His deity is so holy and infinitely pure, and he's going to take that wrath upon sin that's going to be put upon him. And his humanity, he's looking at it going, is there any other way? Let this cup pass from me. Any other way, Father, but not my will, yours be done. It was awful, the cup that the Son of God looked into. And it put him on his knees, crying out to his father with a sod being covered with blood in the middle of the night, sweating through his pores. That's what he bore. Don't let that go over lightly. He went up on that cross and he bore every last drop so that you'll never have to. Luke tells us he was in agony. Our sins were placed upon him legally. And God did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. He poured out his full, undiluted wrath on his own son for his hatred and his judgment against our sin. The blessed reality of substitution. It's my bread and it's my hope of glory. Spurgeon said in one word, the great hope that the Christian rests is in the word substitution. The vicarious sacrifice of Christ for the sinner, Christ being made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Christ offering up a true and substitutionary sacrifice in the place of sinners is the cardinal fact of the gospel. This is it. The cross. He himself bore our sins. And thirdly, Peter says he did it in his body on the, on the wood. His body, the body that the Father prepared for him. So the, the Father prepared a body that he could come, fill it as fully God, and to make a sacrifice for sin. Fully God, fully man, to bring us at one minute back into relationship. He bore our sins 
but he did it in his own body, his human body. And this body was marred and disfigured for our sake. His body was crucified for us. His body bore the wrath of God upon it. No words can describe what his body endured on that cross so that we would never have to face such a furnace of fury. I'm never going to have to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because he did. Oh, the wondrous cross. And Peter continues and he tells us there was a purpose to the cross. If you look in verse 24, there's a purpose clause. And it's a hinna that, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. There is a, a purpose for him bearing that on the cross. And it's that we might die, and the die to sin is the dominion of sin. When we were unbelievers, and all we could do, we were, we were just trapped in this bondage of nature's night, and we couldn't get out of it. The dominion of sin, no matter how hard you worked against the law, scrubbed, rubbed up against it, went to church, did moral things, there was nothing you could do to break the dominion of sin. So the cross it says you've, you've died to that dominion. Not its presence, but its dominion. And that you might start living then to righteousness. This cross has set us free to live rightly now related to our God, to do right things for the right reasons because of God. Which is what? I'm an, I know I'm a broken record. It's to love God with your heart, mind, soul, and strength and your neighbor as yourself. Have you been set free to that? Too many people hide behind doctrine and pounding people. Do you have that? Have you been set free to righteousness, to love because of the love that we just looked at on that cross? It did something amazing. It was legal. But sinners can now stand righteous before the throne of God in him, we're justified. We are not guilty. We can stand. But guys, it did something practically as well. It did that legally. Our standing legally before God is just. But it did something practically. It broke the penalty of our sin, and it broke the power of our sin. And the promise of God is one day it's going to break the very presence of sin. Amen? Amen? And so I want to put this all back then. Now take all of that and bring it back into our context. And this morning I want you to see something beautiful. When you get the gospel that he himself bore our sins in his body, you are joined to Christ in a union. And sin no longer has tyranny over you. You are free to be a slave of God. You're no longer a slave of self. What freedom. And so I am free to not have to look good to everyone. I am free that I don't have to get my own way. I don't have to prove I'm always right. I don't have to bring justice to anybody who wrongs me. You don't have to get your way any longer because your way now is what is pleasing to God and what is good for others. So with unruly government and bosses and next chapter, husbands, what glorifies God and what helps others and what gives you peace, submit to God. Bring yourself under God and what he's doing. Be gracious and forbearing and submissive to authority when they wrong you because it will show the world God and when they get saved, they will glorify him for your example. It will bring peace into your own heart and conscience because you keep entrusting yourself to God. I don't have to sit, stay up all night worrying about these things. I just, I give it to you, God. You're wiser, you know how to deal with it. I don't have to do this. What freedom to entrust it to God. And so this cross is he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, and there is now a power to break you from self-love and self-absorption so that you can die to sin and live to righteousness in the power of Jesus Christ. Look at the cross, and there's power to overcome this kind of a treatment. It's more than an example. There's power in the name of Jesus. There is power to live and act this way. And so yes, more than an example, amen? But conquering victory, to live his example, 
to go live this example. He breaks the power of canceled sin. I'm no longer a slave to sin. I am not gnarly and fighting, getting my rights, returning evil for evil, insult for insult, arguing to prove my points, fighting for the top slot. This cross can break the power of such behavior. What this could do to some marriages here this morning, it's a must to be broken from that. And the only thing I've ever found that can break the power of dominion to self, there's no power. Our our nuclear bombs can't break this. But there's a cross where he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. And there's a power in that to break that dominion. It must. And if that's not enough, I want to show you even more to bring about this excellent behavior among the Gentiles. Look with me in verse 24c. For by his wounds you were healed. How? Well, for, in verse 25, you don't start a sentence with for, do you? That's explanatory. How? How did his wounds heal us? Well, you were continually straying like sheep, but now you've returned to the shepherd and the guardian of your souls. So once you were straying like sheep, like Isaiah 53, you're, you're, you're wandering. Sheep, remember I told you that they wander from the fold of God. We studied Psalm 23, I think, for eight weeks. And a sheep can be lost 15 feet away from home. They have no sense of direction. And so we, we don't know how to find home. And we keep looking for it and we can't find it. We, we're lost. We're like sheep going our own way. We, we're straying from the good shepherd by nature when you come in this world. And we turn to our own way, self as a center reference. And what will make me happy is if self is loved and worshipped and pampered and secure. And so that's what I turn to. We could never find home. Religion can't help. Nothing could get us home. We're going toward cliffs. (laughs) We're going to go off cliffs and we're running to wolves. Here, eat me. We go in the shadow of the valley of death and we fear evil. I'm scared to death of death. The most anxious animal, uh, the sheep, can't rest until everything is safe around it and made right, then it can lie down in green pastures. We could never rest. So if I had to describe unbelievers, if you're here this morning, you can't rest. You're always anxious. You have no idea what rest is. You spend all your money on drugs and sleep aids and you can't find rest. And Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. That's better than melatonin. We were made for God, but we couldn't find Him. What's the worst thing in the world? Is I've got a God-shaped void. I've been made in His image. I've been made for Him, and I can't find Him. We're straying away from Him, and we're left to ourselves to seek for self to try to find home. There's a way that seems right to a man in the end, it it leads to death. We couldn't find it. So how did his wounds heal us? Well, in verse 25, they healed us because now through the atonement, we've returned to the shepherd and the guardian of our soul. Guys, we have a shepherd, (laughs) a good shepherd. The atonement has brought us to God. It brought us back into the fold of God. Our wandering is over. Our trying to find what will fill these hearts that that need it has been found. I found it in Christ Jesus. I'm no longer a dumb sheep wandering from the fold of God, wandering away from Him in my pursuit of trying to fill a void. It's been filled. I found the answer. And it was my shepherd hanging on a cross, dying for my sins to bring me to God, the good shepherd. It broke the power of sin, and I died the life that I live now in this body. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I have a good shepherd and a guardian of my soul. What did Jesus say? The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. It's Isaiah 53. It's John 10. Now I have everything that I need in Christ. The Lord is my shepherd. What? I don't need anything. 
I've been brought back to God, and now the God of the universe is my shepherd. I can lie down in green pastures because everything is safe. He's the one who's taking care of me. I don't, I don't want. I have it all. So what happens if you wrong me or mistreat me? What if you abuse me, slander and criticize me? I have it all in my good shepherd. I, I don't need that. I don't have to have that approval or that acceptance. I, I have everything I need in the good shepherd. I'm one with him. I'm safe. Goodness and loving kindness pursues after me all of my days. I lie down in green pastures. I have it all in him. I, I don't have to have all of this world. Isn't that freedom? Shoot me with your insults and hit me with your fists. Because he was the bullseye of God's wrath on a cross. So that now I'm the apple of his eye. Just the sheep of his pasture. And how sweet it is to have the good shepherd. And how did Jesus do it? He kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And as Jesus said a few more things on that cross, the very last thing, into thy hands I commit my spirit. That was his peace. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. That's how he endured all of the ill treatment of this world. He just kept entrusting himself to God to his very last breath. I give myself to you, Father. This is how I will do it. Into thy hands I commit my life and my mistreatments to the shepherd of my soul. All hell is set against me, but the good shepherd is for me. The peace of the gospel of Jesus Christ. May God grant Southside the spirit. And may many come to glorify God in the day of their visitation because of our excellent behavior. We'll be so different from the world when we live and manifest these kind of lives. And they'll start asking you, what is the hope within you? And so if you're suffering unjustly and really beat up, I want you to look at your standard, Jesus Christ, who uttered no threats, just kept entrusting himself to God. And I want you to look at your substitute. He himself bore your sins on the cross in his body. And I want you to look at the good shepherd. I shall not want. I've been brought back to God. I'm in the fold. I'm protected. And I'm safe. I pray that we would shine this marvelous light of him who's called us out of darkness. And I just thank God for the beauty and the glory of what we just looked at. And I, I pray, um, if you've come here this morning and you, you do not know God, um, the gospel, a, it's a call to come home. C come home. You've been made for God and you're trying to find this satisfaction, this void in this world, and nothing's working. That's why you're here. Nothing's working. And Jesus Christ came into the world to bring us back to God, the good shepherd. And he did it by hanging on a cross. And I pray that you would look to this Christ and believe in him and be saved. Let's go to God and pray. Father, I thank you for the holy ground that we stood on this morning. God, I thank you for 1 Peter 2, 24 through 25. Uh, it takes our breath away. And yet I thank you that it causes us to live to righteousness. I thank you for our substitute. God, we could never praise you. If I, had, I just want 10,000 tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. I, I just thank you for what he did, he himself. God, we worship you. This is an amazing gospel. I thank you for our shepherd. I thank you that we have returned to the good shepherd and the guardian of our souls. Oh, what a safe place we dwell in this morning. Let every child of God feel their safety. Let them look at this shepherd and see the beauty of it to where they don't want. God, take away all of our wants. Swallow them up that the Lord is our shepherd. God, let that just drive out fear, the perfect love of God. And so we pray, Lord, that this would cause us to live different in this generation. 
God, that we would go in and we would be those who shine a light in our mistreatment and people with scoliosis who are crooked and unreasonable and abusing us and some in our own homes and some in our neighborhoods, families. God, I pray that this would be what would start coming out of us, that they would see Christ in us and that many would be drawn to this beautiful Savior who's been lifted up and all men who will look upon him will be saved. God, I thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's in his precious name that we pray. Amen.